Um, so with us today, our title of today's webinar is Transitional Care Planning, When Complex Kids Outgrow Pediatric Care. And with us today, we have two colleagues from the uh, Children's Hospital in London, Ontario. Uh, you may recall uh, Jill Sanga was, was one of our presenters today, was with us a couple weeks ago with the presentation on medical legal collaborations. Uh, and we did have a question at that time about which London are we talking about because of our international audience. It is London, Ontario, Canada, <laughs> not London, England. Um, and Jill is a social worker at the, the London, at the Children's Hospital at the London Health Sciences Centre. Uh, and uh, again, was with us uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and this week, new to uh, CAFC's pro the CAFC Presents presentations is Daniel, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to pronounce this right, Highbane is how I'm going to pronounce it. I hope that's right. Uh, what's that? Close enough. <laughs> Close enough, okay. Uh, and uh, Danielle is a nurse practitioner at uh, the London Children's Hospital. And they're going to be talking to us about their uh, uh, transitional care uh, program at the London Children's Hospital. So uh, I'll pass the virtual podium, uh, or at least the microphone, over to you, and I will control the slides from here for you. Okay, thanks, Doug. It's Val Rousam, Director of Children's Care here at London Health Sciences. And uh, I am going to introduce uh, our two uh, speakers as well as uh, one of our parents. Um, so as our children with medical complexity age and live longer, we have a population of teens that require specialized care and services that extend beyond the pediatric years. And these children have been cared for in the pediatric realm and see many subspecialists to manage their care. It's a shared care model uh, here with uh, in-house pediatrician and family doctor at the hub, coordinating referrals and ensuring community supports are in place. But as we are coming to know, uh, with one sleep, a 17-year-old becomes an 18-year-old adult. And this population relies heavily on the healthcare system, uh, their parents, significant others, community support, and specialized caregivers to ensure their ongoing well-being. What we have come to know is these high needs children enter an adult healthcare system where physicians and nurses are ill-equipped to handle the multiple and complex needs of these kids and have little experience to deal with situations that arise for nonverbal and medically fragile 18-year-old patients. So the parents become frustrated, frightened, overwhelmed by the transition to care that they feel is substandard in comparison to their previous experience. Um, and the impetus for this review came when I met with a family struggling with this very issue. Parents have expressed a desire to continue to receive care from the pediatric system that helped them navigate their personal journey. The healthcare system and pediatricians are not able to continue to provide this care for many reasons, including legal liability. So what got us in, to this juncture is real life experience of parents and children who are medically fragile, with complex care situations. Um, issues have arisen that have not been resolved by the end of the 17th year. So as a pediatric team, we needed to determine what we could do as a caring and compassionate organization that espouses the principles and objectives of exceptional experiences, extraordinary people, and engaging partnerships. So how do we ready the teen and their parents for this next step in this important milestone and journey? Maria Robinson wrote, nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. So we recognized early on in our research that an NP position would be paramount to the transition issue because there were no guidelines or policies or pathways to ensure a smooth transition of these complex children in transition. So we then made a decision to strike a transition to adult care council because we recognized in our lit search that this issue is becoming a provincial and national issue and that it's not just isolated to Children's Hospital in London, Ontario. So our objective was to bring parents, community partners and caregivers from both the adult and pediatric subspecialties to work through the many issues and make recommendations on the development of a robust transition process, recognizing young adults need different model of care than adults. So I will now turn this over to the drivers of this work uh, from the inception of this committee, Danielle Highbein, who is an intermediate care and transition planning pediatric nurse practitioner who has been with us for two years, and Jill Sanga, uh, the inpatient pediatric social worker who's been with children for 10 years, and finally one of our parent partners, Brenda Nesbitt, 
who will speak to her experience and the work we've done over the past 18 months. So I'm not sure who's up next, Jill. Thanks, Val. Uh, Doug, do you want to move to the next slide? Thanks. So uh, again, we appreciate uh, your patience in waiting while we get our technical difficulties figured out. Um, the intent today was really to uh, briefly talk about a bit about the background which Val did um, in the introduction. Um, we wanted to uh, ensure that we incorporated a parent's perspective on transitioning as this really was the driving force to looking at transitional care within our hospital and talk a bit more about complex care in pediatrics and pediatrics and our definition around that and then talk a bit more about the development of the clinic itself, the who, what, when, and why of the transitional care planning clinic and some of the future ideas that we have for further development of transitional care at our hospital. And next slide. Um, we thought that what we would do is start off by um, giving you a bit of a picture of what Children's Hospital London Health Science Center looks like um, to further conceptualize what transitional care planning um, looks like with our hospital and it, its uniqueness. Um, as you can see, this is a picture of London Health Science Center, and uh, what's unique is that Children's Hospital is a, is a hospital within a larger hospital. We're a 117-bed inpatient unit, which is uh, inclusive of an inpatient program as well as a neonatal intensive care unit and a pediatric critical care unit. We see approximately 131,000 uh, children per year through our hospital in both the inpatient and outpatient world as well as our eMERGE department. And what's also unique is that we have a Thames Valley Children's Center, which is a rehabilitation center, which is on site at our hospital. When we were looking at the number of complex care children potentially that are within our hospital, um, what we found was that it was actually quite difficult to identify those numbers because um, we hadn't been clear until now um, as to what would be inclusive of complex care by its de definition at our hospital. So um, in looking at developing transitional care, one of the other things that we had committed to doing was also looking at a better definition of what complex care means to us within our organization. Um, however, um, through IC, um, within our Southwest Lynn, so within Southwestern Ontario, uh, it has been identified that there are approximately 1,093 uh, kids uh, who um, are identified as having complex medical needs. And I would, our, our group would probably say that this number is fairly low. Um, as the data only collected those that were inpatients and, uh, and not uh, those that would be seen on an outpatient basis within uh, hospitals in our Southwest Lynn. Next slide. Okay. Um, and Doug, maybe before we move on to defining complex care, I'm wondering if we could just pull the audience at this point. Sure. Uh, so you're going to see a little screen pop up on your, or a little window pop up on your screen that's got, that has our question of the day, which is, do you have a transitional care program in your center? Uh, so you just go up and click on the screen and choose one of the answers there. Uh, yes, no, or you're in the process of establishing one. So we'll just wait for the answers to come in. We'll give everyone uh, another couple of seconds to make their selection. All right, and then we'll just close this off and we can see, we'll see the results here. So we can see that 40% of the audience uh, does have a transitional care program in their center, 31% does not, and 28% are in the process of establishing one. Okay. Hi, it's Danielle talking now. Um, our next slide is looking at, as Jill spoke about, um, can we go back one? 
slide, please? Sure. Oh, wait. Ooh. I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> wait, uh... Oh, okay, we're good. No, that's the slide I want. Okay. More technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> what Jill spoke, oh, no, that one, the divine and complex care, thanks. Um, Jill talked about the fact that um, when we were looking at our numbers of kids with complex issues, we really hadn't defined down what complex kids really um, meant to us. Um, so when we looked through the literature, we pulled out a couple of different definitions about um, which children really fit this category that we were looking at. So the broader um, term in the literature is children with special health care needs, and these are the children that are at an increased risk of chronic physical developmental behavior behavioral or emotional conditions, and these kids require health care and health-related services um, at a type or amount that are above and beyond what other children um, would normally require. Uh, so that's sort of the broader category. The children that we really um, decided to focus on in our transition clinic were the children with medical complexity. So these are the, um, the medically fragile um, may or may not have technology needs, but essentially those children with chronic conditions that are um, associated with typical or with your significant functional status limitation. So we're really looking at those CP kids, the ones with um, the chronic seizure disorders, the ones that are uh, may or may not be mechanically vented, um, your trach kids, your feeding tube children. So the most complex of the group. If you can just flip to the next slide. When we looked historically at what children, what complex care meant here at Children's Hospital, we don't have um, a complex care program that may look like other people's complex care programs. It's, our program is currently in development as we develop our transition program. But the, traditionally, we focused on those kids who needed complex discharge planning. Um, so the kids with new trachs, who the parents required a lot of teaching and stuff to go home. Uh, and then traditionally, once discharged, these children weren't readmitted to any specific team in our hospital. But because our hospital is small, the parents um, got used to the nursing units they were on. They got used to the nurses. They got used to the doctors. So it, it worked in the way that um, it was running. But so we're really looking at those children with multiple health issues, those that are followed by different specialty services. As it, we talked about before, the medically fragile technology dependent, uh, those children that have frequent and repeated hospitalizations, they may or may not need extensive discharge planning and those that have multiple hospital and community support. Um, and when it came time for these children to turn 18, there really was no transition planning. It was disjointed. Um, it was the responsibility of the parent to really um, direct the child's care once they turned 18. Next slide, please. That's good. Anyway, so this, Next, we're looking at the trends in complex care. Just This is leading us into why we developed a transition program. Um, in the literature, 90% of teens now are with special health care needs are surviving into adulthood. Well, well historically, they didn't. Um, and some of the, um, Jill had talked about the ISIS numbers earlier. And other um, information that came out of that research was that it translated, these children translated into about 1 to 5% of the total health care costs in pediatrics, um, even though there is, they amount for about 15% of um, the children in North America who have special health care, chronic health care needs. So it's a small number who require a lot of services. Next slide, and I'm going to transition over to Brenda, who's going to talk about her experiences as a parent. And we're going to go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide, please, Doug? Hello. There we go. My name is Brenda, and this is my daughter. She is going to be 20 years old in three days. She has a very pleasant personality, an extremely happy disposition, and is very full of life. She never complains and is very easy to please. She loves music. Her favorite artist is Shania. 
but she also loves the bagpipes and our national anthem. Her favorite TV show is The Big Bang Theory, which always generates squeals of delight for the full duration of the show. She loves going to school. She enjoys shopping, bowling, the movies, and playing board and Wii games. She uses an augmentative communication eye blink switch to tell jokes at school every day, and she uses it for playing her lines in a summer theater program she attends every year. Halloween is the biggest occasion in our home. Every year we try to outdo previous year's costumes, and we always incorporate Mickey's wheelchair into the scene. She loves the attention she gets about her elaborate costumes every year. Despite all of the joy she experiences in her life, Mickey suffers from complex medical needs as a result of birth asphyxia. She is non-communicative and has no voluntary muscle movement. She is dependent in all aspects of daily living. Her medical history is quite extensive and includes seizures, developmental delay, cortical visual impairment, scoliosis, osteopenia, recurrent pancreatitis, recurrent pneumonia, gut dysmotility, neurogenic bladder requiring intermittent catheterizations, and she requires continuous GJ tube feed. She is also oxygen dependent overnight. Can we switch to the next slide, please? It was very hard to lose the pediatric physicians we had come to know so well. They celebrated all of the highs with us and supported us through all of the lows. They understood Nikki and they understood us. We had no preparation for transition except for the expectation that a transition process did not exist and that the adult world would be a challenging and frustrating one. I was bewildered by the fact that so many adult physicians could, tur could turn us down for care, yet we had no choice but to seek care in the adult world. I felt like I was, sorry, I think I'm a little stuck here, sorry. Um, this magnitude are feelings of loss, dread, fear, and anxiety. I felt like I was going into the adult world blind. The lack of a transition process put a heavy onus on me for the knowledge transfer. One of the challenges we faced in transition was respect. Despite the fact that I felt like the onus was on me for transferring knowledge about Nikki, I was offered very little regard for my knowledge and opinions in the adult inpatient world. A large part of this was due to the fact that the adult physicians and nurses were never given the opportunity to understand Nikki at her baseline. It was not until two of her pediatric specialists got involved upon my request that I was taken seriously. In the pediatric world, this was invaluable to her physicians. In the adult world, my knowledge was either not called upon or it was completely disregarded. If you can comprehend that Nikki lives a very full and happy life and is one tough little cookie who has made it through many medical challenges, then you can understand why we fight so valiantly for her. Because she can't communicate verbally with us, we rely heavily on her baseline medical status and her behavior to help us gauge her illness or wellness. Another challenge we faced was lack of access and connection to the adult consultant. Because of this, we had frequent delays in having our questions answered, frequent miscommunications, and in my opinion, this resulted in a delay of test treatment and extended her hospital stay. System navigation was very difficult, despite the fact that both the children's hospital and the adult hospital are housed under the same roof. They are two vastly different worlds. All of a sudden, I found myself having to learn a new system at the same hospital. There is a heavy reliance on me in the adult world to provide Nikki's constant care in the hospital. Nursing ratios are poor for the adult population and don't take into account the constant needs and constant monitoring of highly complex individuals. Inpatient medical wards are very different between the pediatric and adult care. Adult wards are populated largely by elderly adults and because of this, bed placements can often be inappropriate for young adults. Adult wards are also remiss of comfort stimulation and distractions that were abundant in the pediatric world. 
this, this puts an even greater burden on me to provide this for my daughter while I'm already providing most of her care in the hospital. We are also very alarmed by the presence of armed guards at some bedsides and emergency and patient rooms. And by armed guards, I mean um, jail guards or police officers. We never experienced this in the pediatric world and the realization that there were patients considered to be dangerous in the next bed or the next room made us fear ever leaving Nikki alone. And I'm going to pass this back to Danielle right now. If you can just switch to the next slide, that'd be great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and really looking and touching on what Brenda spoke about, when our transition group went back to the literature, many of the challenges that Brenda faced were very similar to all of the barriers that um, were throughout the transition literature regard, um, relating to families who transition. And this is not only related to those children with medical complexity, but all children with special health care needs. Um, when you look at access to health care, all um, the, in most cases, the majority of care providers when a child turns 18 change. Um, it, and it may be that there are no adult specialists that have knowledge about the um, pediatric diseases that some of these kids are um, when they move into the adult world. Um, there's differences in the way that clinics are run from how they're run in pediatrics. Um, there may not be access to a nurse case manager or a nurse practitioner that they had access to in pediatrics. And um, they also, there's decreases in the amount of other services that are provided. So physio, occupational therapy, um, community supports, et cetera. And also there's just a general difference in the difference between pediatric and adult care and that pediatric care is very family centered and adult care is very patient disease focused. So that in itself is a huge um, difference. Uh, there's lack of knowledge related to the transition as Brenda spoke about as well. I know in our situation, we um, almost all kids with complex health issues went home to a pediatrician when they were discharged from hospital. And at 18, we're now expecting family doctors to pick back up these complex kids and they just are not comfortable with, um, with these kids because they've been managed by such a specialized team getting them to this point that it's a big change switching them back over. Um, and then the third one, lack of information and uncertainty regarding the transition process. There just is really not a lot of information for families regarding the transition process and they were really unprepared for that process um, once the transition happened. And as we spoke about earlier, it's sort of an overnight change um, from turning 17 to 18. I'm going to give you back to Brenda. Slide, Next slide, please. I do want to touch on the successes that we experienced as well. I don't want to foster the negative with everything. Uh, Danielle created a care plan for Nikki after our first adult inpatient experience, and this was a huge success. I have to say it's very detailed. It's awesome. It includes not only her uh, daily routine, but also her likes, her dislikes, other team members involved with her care, um, sizes of tubes that she uses, everything. So it was an extremely uh, useful tool for the nurses. It has made Nikki's care in the hospital a lot more consistent. It's reduced a lot of mistakes, and it has made my life a lot easier as well. The nurses who have had an opportunity to use it love it. Assistance from the pediatric specialist can be immeasurable in times of crises, especially for those adult physicians who are unfamiliar with a patient history, care, or baseline. As a parent, I would rather an adult physician, or any physician for that matter, tell me that they don't know something. I, everybody is human. Uh, I'd rather they say that than, than blame a, a new behavior on, on just behavior instead of something medical related. Uh, but if a doctor is willing to admit that they don't know something and willing to help me get through it, I respect that a lot more than passing it off as something else. And this is where the pediatric physicians really came in to help us because they knew Nikki 
and they could stand behind me and say, yes, this is definitely not her and we need to look into this further. Consistency in nursing during admissions is also key. Once nurses get to know these children, it's very key to keep those nurses um, scheduled with those children when they are in. That alleviates a lot of anxiety on the family uh, part as well. And when I finally decided to take my concerns to a higher level, I was actually expecting resistance. Instead, I was pleasantly surprised and relieved to be met with openness and to be taken very seriously. My concerns were acted upon immediately, and I commend the leadership at this hospital on their prompt attention, their recognition of a lack of process, and their commitment to the creation of a transition program. There is a lot of work left to do, but I have a lot of faith in their commitment. Next slide, please. This is Jill. Uh, in considering the areas of, of which um, we wanted to focus the clinic on, um, what we did was we reviewed many other centers of, of which some are listening in today um, and what they were currently doing within their transitional care clinics. We also did a review of literature to identify whether there was any evidence-based best practice around what elements supported a positive transition to adult care. There were several reoccurring things that came up throughout the literature, um, and some of these were really about the importance of preparing for the transition, uh, the transition in that it, it should be flexible in its timing, um, and it shouldn't be age-dependent, um, that it include a good process for care coordination, and um, it also identified the importance of having a transitional care clinic um, as an avenue for patients and families to come to, to talk about their concerns and to talk about their needs as they move forward into adult care. Um, the other thing that uh, was important uh, and identified throughout the literature was the need for adult-centered healthcare providers to be engaged within the transitional care process, not just at the time of transition, but also leading up to that transition. So families and patients have an opportunity to, uh, to meet with their adult care providers and uh, establish clear plans for care once they actually make the move over to adult care. So from doing this, um, review of literature as well as looking at many other programs that already have pre-existing transitional care programs, we decided to structure our clinic um, in such a way that it uh, assessed both the healthcare and the medical management needs of families and patients, but that we also explored and looked at education, we looked at living arrangements of patients we um, looked at finances as that is a major issue for many families who are losing pediatric funding and going on to the adult world. We also look at vocation and, um, and estate planning. And one of the things that is not on here is that another element is, is really around the emotional support of the grief, loss, fear, and anticipatory anxiety around moving to adult care. Next slide. <clears throat> so the, this is uh, currently what our clinic looks like. Um, our referral process uh, is really uh, self-referral from families. Uh, as well, we do get referrals from other physicians and staff members that identify families who would benefit from transitional care support. Um, we hold an evening clinic in our pediatric medical day unit, which is held once a month. And um, we chose uh, an evening time really to allow for better accessibility of families that are working, that have other obligations to be able to come um, in the evening as opposed to a day. And uh, currently we're booking two families per visit. And we're finding that we're spending typically about an hour and a half to two hours uh, with families. Um, as it is right now as well, we um, are seeing uh, children who are 17 and up, so uh, we're doing a bit of a catch-up right now, hoping to 
uh, be able to connect with as many families as possible who are going to be transitioning within the next 12 months. Um, but our, our goal uh, is to uh, decrease that age and have uh, patients and families come when their child turns 14 years of age. Next slide. I apologize. This uh, you're, you're seeing a different uh, slide than uh, than what we have up here, and I'm and uh, I think Doug, I likely sent you uh, a more outdated version. And so what I'll do is we'll make sure that um, the slide that we're viewing is sent to you, Doug, so that you can post that online. And um, the intention of the slides was really to identify all of the relationships and connections that we've made in order to be able to support patients and families through the transition process. And so um, the clinic itself is run by, uh, as identified by Val, and uh, is that uh, there's a nurse practitioner and a social worker, and we meet with patients and families. Um, we recognize that transition can only be successful with the coordination of both existing uh, as well as new adult center health care providers and support. Uh, so we, uh, because we are a fairly new clinic, we continue to establish relationships with others in the hospital and from the community to uh, help families with the transition uh, process. I do want to highlight, and I apologize, you can't see this on the slide, that some of the unique relationships that we have um, within the hospital are, of course, engaging our uh, adult center health care providers, and, and that's still very much a work in progress. Um, the other piece that uh, we have engaged is our uh, nurse practitioner with the symptom management and palliative care team to assist us with doing um, care planning and and, um, and looking at goals as they relate to pain management and palliation for um, some patients. Um, and then from a social work perspective, um, we also uh, have partnered with uh, pro bono law. And so there is a, med a medical legal relationship, which I'll talk about in another slide, uh, in which families have access to uh, estate planning assistance, as well as access to assistance around completing documents uh, in order to help them with transition. Um, we've uh, attempted to engage with uh, our regional hospitals because uh, we have many, many patients and families that come from across Ontario and within the Southwest area. Um, we recognize that um, as we see patients and families within our transitional care program, um, many of them have home hospitals that they often go to for uh, medical treatment on a more regular basis. So we are connecting with nurse practitioners as well as patient relations specialists and social workers within those regional hospitals to also help families that um, that would be transitioning within their facility as well to negotiate and develop care plans um, for transitions there. Next slide. So as I briefly identified, um, there is a unique medical legal partnership um, that we have in Children's Hospital, but is also unique to our transitional care planning clinic. Um, what we know and understand is that medical interventions alone um, are, do not uh, mean a successful transition, that it really is ensuring that the legal and the social needs of families is also addressed as, as they move on to adult care. And so we've established a relationship with our pro bono law lawyer and the participating firms within our community. And um, families that meet the requirement of the pro bono law program are able to receive assistance around estate planning needs. And so when we were looking at what would be important with respect to estate planning needs, um, at this point, what they're helping us with is really around the establishment and usage of hunts and trust funds, um, they also help families around power of attorney for personal care, um, looking at wills, 
um, registered disability savings plans and special insurance or life insurance policies. Um, we also heard from families that uh, transition funding and applying for adult care support can often be an overwhelming and tedious process. So through the pro, pro bono law partnership, we are scheduled to launch a documentation clinic next month that will be staffed by law, law clerks from our local university. And through this clinic, patients and families will have the opportunity to receive assistance with applications such as uh, applying for the Ontario Disability Support Program as well as um, DSO. Next slide. So some of the goals of our transitional care planning clinic, which we've already touched on, um, are really about identifying and developing goals um, that are holistic um, for the family for their future, as well as for the patients themselves. Um, we identify challenges uh, that uh, might be anticipatory or that a patient and family are currently experiencing, and we try and come up with creative potential solutions that involve a number of uh, care providers and supports that are currently existing in their um, world and really try and establish links with community resources um, to help with the care coordination. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, again, our goal is really to address any feelings of anxiety, fear, grief, and or loss related to the transition or the anticipation of the transition. Our other goals are um, looking at creating a health summary and care plan, which can travel with the young adult as they are um, receiving care in the adult world. The health, the health summary is meant to be um, sort of a cumulative past medical history, current treatment plan, updated medical list, um, contact list for all the pediatric providers with links to all the um, adult care providers. So all of, the, all of those that have been referred to during the transition process, a list of all of the young adult community support, um, as well as goals of care and resuscitation wishes. So really a, a glimpse at um, sort of the 18 years of the child's life. It's not meant to replace each of those discharge summaries that each of the pediatric uh, physicians would provide to the adult care providers, but just something that the parents can have in hand if they show up in the emergency room um, to help um, the team there look after their child. The care plan is essentially a glimpse in the day of the life of the young adult. It would contain all of the care needs and medications um, and anything that would work at dealing with the child during that day. The final page of the care plan um, contains helpful hints and tips for caring for that child, as well as how that child communicates, likes and dislikes, um, anything that would be important for looking after that teen, whether they're in hospital or at home. Next slide. This is just an example of what the care plan template looks like at this point in time. Um, we had tried to put in one that was semi-developed, but it became very wordy. But I think based on what you can see here, you get an idea of what we're working towards. The first column, it really just lists um, every hour of the day. Uh, so the second and third page continues it, um, into the full 24-hour schedule. I have it split up between like a day shift and a night shift if the child was going to be in hospital. The first column looks at um, what their feeds and flush needs are, and it can be adapted if they do eat orally. The second column is any physical care. So do they have any trach care? Do they have any, um, any chest physio needs? If they're cast, anything like that in there. The third column looks at any of the medications. So it's listed out hour by hour. And then the fourth column is for any extra care needs that they may have. At the top of the document, um, the child's name, date of birth, when the care plan was last updated, um, emergency contacts for that child. And we've also, um, will likely add in a line relating to their diagnosis, just as something to help. Um, and then as you work down the document at the end, as I spoke to before, there's likes, dislikes, et cetera. Some of the challenges to this document are just generally getting it accepted into the adult world. In Nikki's situation, we've had good success so far. So I think as we go forward, um, we'll get feedback from the adult care providers as far as how this document can help them in their world. Another challenge is how do we keep it updated once they're through the transition process. At this point, 
um, it will become the responsibility of the parents. Uh, and then so it will be up to them whether they keep it updated. Um, when we first used the care plan, we did take it to some of the nurses and the nursing coordinator on the unit that the child was most likely going to be admitted on. And it was reviewed and decided that it would be beneficial to them. And so then just making it as a usable document. Uh, and then it's a very personalized document. So not no two of these would look the same. Next slide. Next slide. So this slide really speaks to what we've learned so far. Um, what's listed here is really sort of a range of what's been referred to us so far. Um, children with medical complexity with involvement of multiple medical services requiring transition. Uh, families have come to us with concerns about disruption to a care plan that's already in place and whether that would be accepted when their teen is transferred to adults. As Jill spoke about before, the loss and grief, grief over losing pediatric healthcare team members. Um, families are just looking for information regarding adult resources. Um, families have come to us that they're losing funding and what that impact is going to have on their family. And that's funding relating to community support. Uh, and then there's, we've had families come to us over concerns with guardianship for medical management when their child turns 18. And these are children who have complex kids who have been part of the CAS system. Um, and the families that they're living with have been acting as guardians, but all that changes when they turn 18. Next slide. Some of the other things that we've that we've learned so far through our clinic um, and connecting with families is that, as I spoke to before, a real need for partnership with regional hospitals um, within the community and and within the region around transition planning. Um, we know that what we put in place at our hospital um, can only be successful if those that are in the community and those that are uh, within the, the hospital system and the neighborhoods of families that they need to be engaged to ensure that there's continued success with the transitional care plans that are put in place. We've also learned very much so that there are many systemic issues related to transitions as well as related to supports and services and funding um, for adult care once they transition over. And so, um, that's why the medical legal relationship is important in helping us manage and deal with some of those systemic issues. We also um, realize that there's a real need for uh, adult care providers being involved within the transitional care process prior to transitioning happening. And then the last thing is that as we receive feedback from families, both who have transitioned already as well as those that are going to transition, being able to have a forum where we can explore this feedback and um, and make um, changes uh, are important. Next slide. We're just going to touch quickly on what we don't do in our clinic. Um, we're not set up as a complex care medical clinic, so families are made aware that we're not providing any testing or procedures during these clinic appointments. The only exception to this would be that enteral feeding is part of my current portfolio, and if I can save a family a trip to the hospital um, by doing sort of their last enteral feeding clinic for those kids that are turning 18, I will do heights, weights, and discuss any G-tube or DJ-tube related issues. Um, so that's the only exception to the medical care that we would provide in this clinic. Um, we don't have the capacity to manage any system-related issues, so we can't create funding where no funding exists. We can't create respite beds where they don't exist. Um, and that's a struggle for us that, you know, there's lots that families need, but we can't do at this point in time. And in the long term, um, it will be the family's responsibility to keep these medical summaries and care plans up to date as changes occur. We don't have a mechanism for continuing that process at this point in time. I hope to. Yeah, but hope to at some point in time. Next slide. It's Brenda back here. I'm going to jump back in just to give you my perspective on what um, I've gone through the transition process without a transition program in place. So 
I want to give you an idea of what I think is important in creating a transition program. The first and foremost, I think care plans are key. They're very good tools in helping transfer information on a child's daily life, particularly for inpatient stages where it's helped us the most. As well as for inpatient care, a transition pool or a sharing care model of nurses for patient care between adults and pediatrics so that there can be involvement from adult nurses before transition and involvement from pediatric nurses after transition in the adult world. I think that would be extremely helpful for um, knowledge transfer as well. Um, and to emphasize the consistency in care among inpatient nurses as well, when um, the, the, the individual and the family or the parent become very comfortable with the nurse, it makes our lives a lot easier. And I think it makes the nurses' lives a lot easier too when they work with the child more and, and get to know them better. Nursing ratios um, need to take into consideration the high demands of constant care for complex high needs individuals. And for outpatient care, um, I think it's necessary to facilitate interpersonal relationships between pediatric and adult specialists so that they can become comfortable uh, referring their patients to adult specialists. I think that's a barrier for many pediatric uh, physicians because they just don't know their counterparts in the adult world. Um, patient referrals to adult specialists should be considered at an earlier age, not at age 16 or 17 to be referred to a pediatric specialist, but to refer to an adult specialist, um, and even earlier where possible. Uh, this will lend itself well to the knowledge transfer that becomes so key when the actual transition occurs. And also recognize and enable advocacy role of parents and caregivers. I, I feel very fortunate that the leadership here was very open and I am a part of the transition committee so I feel like I still have the ability to offer my support to them from a personal perspective. And next slide. So, as it's been identified um, throughout the presentation, we are a fairly new um, transitional care planning clinic. Um, as well, uh, the transitional care um, committee or council that was established is fairly new itself. And so some of the things that we're looking forward to in the upcoming months and years is that we do, um, we do intend to uh, decrease the age of referral to the transitional care planning clinic. So um, by 2015, we're hoping that we're going to be able to start at the age of 14 and, um, and meet with families annually within the transitional care planning clinic or um, as they uh, need it. Um, we also are participating in a family health fair which is being held at our organization in June and it is um, for patients and families and uh, there will be topics shared around uh, transitional care planning and again we're engaging with our uh, legal partners as well as our um, health foundation to provide some educational workshops around various elements of transitional care planning. Um, we also intend to put together both a communication plan as well as an educational plan for other staff within pediatrics as well as within the adult world to talk about uh, transition planning and uh, talk about the, the needs of uh, patients and families as they uh, are soon to be transitioned as well as after their transition. And uh, our intention as well is to um, be a consultation to other uh, patient care teams. Um, there are many programs within our hospital that are that are in fact doing transition and those are often those teams that are single system um, oncology, uh, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, um, all have transitional care programs and the intention really would be to ensure that our practice um, of transitional care planning for families is, is both consistent and uh, streamline and that families have access to the same types of uh, resources as well as services around transitional care. Um, and then the other piece is work with, working with our patient relations uh, within the hospital to assess data that's collected um, through 
um, our FM Pro and our Picker, which are um, resources to um, to house uh, concerns or complaints that come through uh, patient relations, and and look at the data that's collected through there to determine initiatives for the future, as well as areas of improvement as it relates to transitional care. And what's not on here as well that I do want to mention is the importance of parent-to-parent -parent mentorship. And so our hope would be that in the future that we would be able to include patients and families who have transitioned who can provide their unique expertise and knowledge about transitioning to support families um, that will be transitioning in the future. Next slide. In continuing to look at the future of our transition clinic, this slide that you're seeing now was a process map that we developed about nine months ago with really how we wanted the future of our transition program to look. So the far left of the slide really looks at how um, these complex patients would gain entry into our transition program. Um, when you look going right, where it streams off into the upper and lower portions, the upper portion is really related to the clinic. So sometime between 14 and 17 year old, years old, these children would be identified, our transition package would be sent to them, and then that sort of flows through the clinic. The bottom piece of where it divides off there is how we hope to draw in adult care providers into the program and engage them in the transition process. And the, to the far right of the screen, um, this would likely be for our most complex patients, but we're looking to have family meetings prior to the age of 17, which encompasses all of their pediatric and ideally the adult care providers that have been identified at that point in time. Um, and just as they move through the system there, and in the end, there'd be an evaluation and analysis of the transition with the ability to um, change anything that had been created at that point. Um, as Jill had spoke, our transition program is really in the initial phases, but our goal at this point is to ensure families are prepared as much as possible for their teens transition to adult care and provide them with the tools and support to support them on their journey. And we. And as she also spoke about, we still have work to do in engaging our adult care providers in this process. Next slide. And just in summary, this is a quote that um, we pulled out of one of the transition articles that really summarizes what we're hoping to do with our transition program. The ultimate, ultim optimal goal of transition is to provide health care that's uninterrupted, coordinated, and developmentally appropriate, psychosocially sound, and comprehensive. Next slide. And this slide just is our contact information if anybody wishes to contact us for further information. Next slide. This is just a list of resources that we've used throughout the presentation and throughout some of our transition um, committees work in looking at the transition program. And that's pretty much the end of what we had to talk about. Are there any questions? Well, maybe I'll just leave the uh, contact information up uh, so that people can maybe jot that down. Okay. We do have a few questions listed here. Um, but I really wanted to make a special thanks to Brenda. Uh, we didn't introduce her off the top of the session, but what a what a, a very powerful and, and important story she had to, to tell and to bring to this presentation. So thank you very much, Brenda, for bringing that. Uh, the first question uh, that, that someone asked was, uh, at what age is considered an, an adult? Is it a hard and fast uh, as of the 18th birthday? Is it, is it dependent on the patient uh, or the situation? Uh, how do you guys address that issue in London? In this institution, it's essentially hard and, a hard and fast rule. At the age of 18, you transition to the adult care world. All right. Uh, the next question is not quite as simple. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I believe that's going to be a provincial recommendation as well. Is it? Okay. Excellent. All right. Or not excellent, but that's, that's interesting. Because it is, I know just in our experience at <laughs> yeah. CAFSEA, from the national perspective, it is it is different across the country. It varies widely from, from province to province yeah, and organization to organization. And we found that. Just, just Looking to at clarify, the provincial recommendation, Val, it's Elaine, is going to be what age? 
18, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, the next question, not quite as simple, is uh, a little more broad, and, and the person is asking, is the solution really to develop transition programs or to change the paradigm of care? The ideal care of some patients will not be will be not to, tr to, to not transition. There needs to be an environment where pediatric and adult care practitioners can come together to provide care to these medically complex patients so that those with the expertise needed can be accessed. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say that's easier said than done. Um, I know that, quite frankly, to um, get the adult practitioners around the uh, council table was very difficult. We did have some come, and we have made some inroads there, but uh, quite frankly, um, it, that has been the most difficult part of this journey. And so, although they feel very uncomfortable with uh, who's coming through the doors in ED or, um, you know, through uh, clinics, um, they haven't made that transition yet to um, wanting to have that information provided. So it's, it's been, that's been difficult. Danielle, do you want to speak to that? I pretty much echo what Val said. It's um, been very difficult to get the adult providers engaged in our process. We're still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next question is. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Just, just, just a question on top of Val and Danielle, what you were just saying. Can you just add a little bit more to this very important question that's on the table now? Just what were some of the barriers? Why that that engagement? Why there was the resistance and. Were there specific sort of concrete, we can't or we, or, or we don't see this as appropriate because, can, can you be a little bit more explicit? Well, we, just, just uh, to speak to um, some of the comments that we had from some of the adult physicians that did come to the table, um, is they're not really sure who should um, be the most responsible physician, I guess. Um, so that, that I think, um, I don't know if that's past the buck or if that's uh, just not, not having a clear understanding of how that happens when the transition occurs. Okay. So I think some of the piece that we've been sort of looking at is um, a navigator, a navigator uh, in the community, a navigator in the hospital, one in the pediatric realm, one in the, in the adult realm. So it may not be a physician that is the navigator, right. uh, but it would be the person that um, you know would be the hub of the hub and spoke type of model, mm -hmm. so that there's um, conversation then going on between uh, the adult and pediatric um, spokesperson, I guess. Um, the other thing that I heard from um, the physicians is that uh, when in fact, one physician said, when I see a patient coming through my adult ED with multiple complexities, it scares the hell out of me. Yeah. That's a direct quote. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's that they're just, they just don't know what to do. And um, so I think it's, it's, there's a bit of fear on the part of the, uh, uh, of the physician in that they think they have to know Everything, everything, every specialty. But really, there are many different subspecialties that are um, caring for these kids. Right. And, and again, I go back to that: we need a navigator for the system. Yeah. And I think somebody that can can connect them with their pediatric providers, so that the the adult physicians know that the pediatric providers are still there to provide them with support in the yep. management of these children. Right. Yeah. Can I add one thing as well? One adult physician, in his words, um, said that nobody wants to quarterback these kids. So I think that their mm. fear is that they will be primary care provider and they don't feel confident in doing that. I think the other barrier is our funding formula yeah. for, for adult care physicians because they know that caring for these children or these adults now um, is very time intensive. Right. And the funding formula, the remuneration does not support that. Right. Right. Okay. 
Thank you. All right. Uh, the next question is uh, referring to your your future goal of starting this transition clinic at the age of 14. Uh, once you uh, get to that point where, you, where the, the kids are part of the clinic at, at that age, who will be responsible for updating care plans and medical summaries from that point until they, until they do leave for the adult system? I think the plan by when starting at 14 is that is something that we can continue to update when they come to clinic visits. It'll be after they turn 18 that that would transition to the parent. Or to the new or to, navigator. Yeah, yeah, or to the, our idealistic navigator on the other side. <laughs> which, which we are working on here at uh, LHSC um, because there is interest to provide that. We just need to understand who that person needs to be, whether it's a nurse practitioner, whether it's a social worker. Right. Um, we're working through those pieces. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, the, the person asking the question gets the sense that the clients that are <laughs> currently uh, being seen in the clinic are currently living in the community. Is that correct? Uh, actually, no. The, most of the kids that we've seen so far come through the clinic have been from communities outside of London. Okay. Uh, well, she's asking if that, if that is so, uh, have you trialed the clinic with inpatients with complex needs being transitioned to a community setting or family home? I think that's one of our goals for the future. I mean, I think there's an element of transitional care that we do um, already for inpatients, particularly mm -hmm. those. <laughs> so currently as it exists now, when a patient is identified as as complex care, um, they they fall under a nurse practitioner. So it's either Danielle or another nurse practitioner that we have here, as well as uh, the same attending physician and a social worker. And so um, in looking at transition, we start the day that they're really admitted to the floor. And it's an ongoing process where we engage um, often CCAC, as well as um, other uh, consultants that are involved in regards to medical management, as well as other community supports. And what we do is, um, in preparation for going home in the week, um, it, sometimes we even do it maybe a, a month or so before discharge, is that we have really a, a case management meeting where we bring in all providers from both community as well as in hospital to talk about um, what the goals of care are once they go home, what the needs of the family are, how can how do we support a family in order for them to be successful at parenting a child with complex medical needs once they get home. And so we do we we do already do that um, with the complex care population um, in looking at um, in looking at their eventual discharge from our hospital. Um. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, the next question is uh, just is first off is saying uh, thanks for the presentation and thought he thought it was a great talk. He's also asking if there uh, is a place to download the presentation and and I didn't mention at the top, but as always uh, for our uh, webinars, we do record them and we post them on the knowledge the CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network that you see on the screen in front of you there, which you can find at ken.cafc.org. Um, so yes, the, the the full audio visual presentation will be uh, put up there, as will uh, the PowerPoint presentation as well. If we uh, and I'll ask our presenters to maybe send me the the, the more up to date version that we didn't have available today, um, and we'll get all that stuff up on the Knowledge Exchange Network for you to download as well. Uh, the next question is, uh, how is the clinic funded? Interesting. Um, <laughs> well, we just. Uh, absorbed it quite frankly and um, you know although uh, we were looking at a time frame outside of, of uh, clinic hours um, that was also uh, to be able to provide a space that this could occur in um, Danielle flexes her time so that um, she's available for the evening and I'm assuming that Jill does as well and our pro bono law lawyer um, also gives us uh, hours so it's it's really within their work um, that currently exists 
and um, and in a clinic space that isn't being used in the evening. Okay. Mm -hmm. The forms and et cetera have all been uh, developed. Um, you know, quite frankly, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We looked at what others were doing and then added, uh, you know, the things that really were important for our children's hospital. But really those forms, et cetera, we've, you know, there is a small uh, amount of uh, funding that's attached to that, but um, I can find that out for you if that's something you'd like to know. Um, so we did it on the spring budget. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and also just to mention, uh, in addition to recording this presentation, we since we did start about ten minutes late, and we do have quite a list of questions, we probably will be end. Up, we will likely end up going right till twelve thirty. So if anyone does have to leave, uh, just remember that we are recording this, so you can always go back and catch uh, and and watch the, the the tail end of the question and answer period if uh, if you do have to go. Um, the next question uh, from Susan is: If you had a complex care program ongoing, do you do you see the transition program incorporated into that program? I, I, would think I think so, it really yeah. is an extension of it, and I think as we develop our transition program, it's going to help us to develop our complex program because we're sort of starting backwards um, in that we've had like a long term how we do complex care, but we haven't encompassed all of the complex care children in that program. So as we get transition up and running, we're looking at how we can improve our complex care in general. Okay. And sort of a related uh, sort of slash follow-up, uh, for youth who are less complex, maybe only involving one or two clinics, uh, is there a program with tools, et cetera, and who would be responsible for implementing that? Um, so there are, as I mentioned, a number of programs uh, who really are multi or sorry, are single system chronic conditions like cystic fibrosis or diabetes. Um, they they really are already doing uh, transitional uh, care, and um, many of those programs, the transitional care piece really does fall to either the nurse practitioner or the nurse case manager engaged with the social worker that um, has those conversations with the families and and um, either informally or formally helps them with uh, transitioning to adult care. Um, there are some programs as well that I that I want to mention where the pediatric um, consultant is um, also providing care to the adult world, which makes it um, easy for families because they don't, they, they continue to have the consistency of the same um, care provider once they transition over to adults. Until they retire. Yes, yeah. until they retire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, how are you transitioning enteral feeding tube care? Are there adult services to transition to in your area? There are not at this point in time. We have one GI physician who also um, who works, his clinics run at the same time as the enteral feeding clinic currently runs. And for the most part, he also does, he also does adult care, so he's been willing to take on the enterally fed kids at this point. Um, and sort of as Val said before, until he retires. And then we're still looking at how we're going to transition those teens or where we're going to transition them to. At this point, um, if they don't necessarily need um, frequent GI follow-up, the dietitian portion of it, we're turning over to the community. All right. And then families also, I have lots of families who will still call me after their teen turns 18. Um, more around like where to go for funding supports and things like that. Right, right. All right. Uh, next question is, to refer to the clinic, does the client and family have to be a client of the London, Sciences, London Health Sciences Centre? At this point, yes. Because I think we have uh, quite a backlog um, of patients within our own system. Um, but, you know, um, as we expand, I guess we will have to look at that. But generally, you know, within our own region, we are looking at those uh, those kids and uh, and making sure that they're looked after in their home communities. All right. Uh, 
So the next question is, who in the adult system has been most receptive to coordinating the transition, transitioning in of young adults? Well, I would say um, that the co-chair of, of the committee is uh, a fellow director who works in um, MedSearch. And um, so she has been instrumental in bringing um, a nurse practitioner to the table who has adult background um, and has been working with the physicians uh, to try and bring, you know, as many adult physicians to the table as possible. Um, and they've, they've come sporadically, but she is, uh, is really um, committed to this, this project and, uh, and to finding that navigator in the adult side of the system. So I would say that's really been our biggest connection with the adult team is having her uh, sit at our table. And she is also sitting on a provincial um, uh, group also looking at transition to adult care with PCMCH. So she has been at that table as our representative because, again, I think they've had some uh, difficulties as well. But. We've also had an uh, anesthetist. Oh, an anesthetist. That's right. We accidentally, this is kind of a funny story, we accidentally invited an uh, anesthetist from uh, um, the uh, well, it's a pediatric anesthetist who also does adult care, but he's he has taken it upon himself to represent the adult side of the house. So <laughs> he's been great. He's actually been at every single meeting. Hasn't missed one. All right. Well, I'll, I'll save you from from asking you to point fingers at who's been the least receptive. So I, we won't we won't go there. But, uh, <laughs> um, but the next question is, how do you how do you find your adult counterparts? And I'm assuming she's asking sort of how do you how do you go about making the connections on a case by case basis? Again, I think um, the initial um, um, invitation to the committee, um, we sat down as a group and uh, tried to determine who best to be at the table. Um, we definitely feel that we're missing a family uh, position from the community. Um, although we send our minutes uh, to him, and Sherry has worked um, tirelessly to <laughs> get at the table, uh, but um, it was just it was just trying to determine what subspecialties on the other side of the house would we need, and also uh, emergency departments. Um, the uh, chief of of uh, emergency has been at the table uh, quite a few times. Uh, internists. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's also CCAC and, um, you know, th those kinds of supports from the community, having families at the table. So Brenda is one of um, uh, two families that have been consistently at the table and we've had um, one other fellow who has transitioned himself from uh, pediatric to adult. So, um, yeah, it's... it's uh, it's been it's been difficult, but I think it's it's still worth um, the effort and the energy to make that happen. Yeah, a couple a couple. But of, I'll tell you. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say from the pediatric side, we've had so many physicians come from the pediatric side. It's been uh, really quite amazing, and uh, and they've had lots to offer, and they too have connected with their colleagues. Mm -hmm. on the adult side. I think as far as individual referrals go for each specific child, that's still up to the pediatric provider to send out those referrals to their adult care providers for that actual transition of care. Right. All right. Uh, a couple of comments here from uh, from a couple of audience members. One is saying, ultimately, the solution is to change the culture of adult care to be more family-centered. I don't think anyone would Absolutely. disagree with that. <laughs> Uh, and the next right. comment, the not, next comment was about uh, just suggesting very early knowledge translation slash relationship building with primary care physicians is vital as they could take over some of the the continuity piece. Agreed. Uh, the next That's a change we're making in in when we're discharging our complex kids home for the first time. We historically always sent these kids home with a pediatrician, and now we're really looking at how can we keep 
their family doctors involved in their care with the pediatrician as a resource versus the primary care provider. So we're starting that from day one. Yeah, I think that's the best mistake that we've learned is that, you know, in um, historically, we have wanted to have our kids seeing pediatricians, but we lose that uh, family physician piece so that when they turn 18, they feel orphaned and the physician really has not kept up with um, the care uh, that's been given over time. So uh, essentially, we're starting from scratch, where now, we, as Danielle said, we bring that family physician, even if the family physician is only seeing the patient once a year, uh, just to have that connection and understand what the care is. Mm -hmm. And this next uh, is sort of a comment slash question. I think you did address this to a certain extent in your in your presentation, and where you were talking about uh, bringing the making the age earlier in which you these children would enter the transition program. But she's, the question is: Should we be focusing on teaching families to coordinate care for their children at a younger age in order to prepare them for the realities of the adult system? You want to talk about the family resource? Yeah. Yeah. So we do, um, uh, I mean, our, our intention in, in really being family, patient and families in our care is one that, uh, it, you know, is holistic. So the other is that we really want to provide resource and support that uh, empower or engage families to be able to manage care independently. We, we definitely um, are cognizant of, of uh, making sure that we're not creating a dependence um, for families to, to require our services and support to, to be able to manage care. And so some of the things that we've, uh, that we've developed within pediatrics is um, a My Care Journal uh, for uh, really anyone. Uh, and we did it with the intention of um, it being a resource for uh, complex care, but has uh, shown success and been used with other teams uh, who uh, have families that uh, have a child with chronic illness. And that is just a tool to help them um, manage, document, and track uh, the, their child's care needs. They take it with them to other appointments. They share it with their their school with their community hospital and it's again a way of them being able to uh, really uh, be the, the primary uh, person for information sharing as opposed to um, relying on their healthcare team here. And there are other, many other things that we've uh, created for families, workbooks um, for new diagnoses uh, within our GI program that's being developed for CF as well as many other programs. Again, giving families tools to empower them to really take ownership for their child's care and create that sense of, of uh, independence and feeling successful at doing so. And, and part of the goal of uh, having, we again have a family resource center here is being able, another outlet of families being able to access resources and information again in order to empower them to really take charge of their child's care. Can I just add one thing here, though? Uh, I am an extremely empowered parent, mm -hmm. and I have the team here that helped me become that way. Mm -hmm. But going into the adult world, it is a different, different culture. And a lot of that information I collected and I have in my head was, as I said in the presentation, regarded. So that's the challenge of that. We do need that connection so that um, the adult side of the world will listen to us. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how is the relationship different or challenging when attempting to provide a seamless delivery of service of services for children residing on reserve, uh, the children with complex need, medical needs residing on reserve? Um, you know what, uh, that is an excellent question. We, um, we have many families that come from northern communities within Ontario 
and um, it really requires us to be quite creative in how we're going to meet needs of families. And so um, we um, engage uh, nursing stations on the reserve. Um, we do offer some satellite uh, clinics, and we do have some providers um, that actually travel to, uh, you know, places like Thunder Bay to provide clinics as well to families that are a little less accessible. We recognize that there are families that do need to travel down to London to connect with um, specialists. And so we, for those families that have challenges, uh, again, as a social worker, we offer assistance around resources of um, flying down here and providing support around accommodation and um, and other resources, but uh, it really is it really is a challenge. And, and again, you know, we attempt to engage those that are already within their community because we know that um, in order for them to be successful, we need to make sure that um, their community and their supports that they have free access to um, are a part of the development of a plan. So. And if you guys uh, have to go at any point, you feel free to just tell me to shut it down. We have about five more questions left, so if you're able to stay, then then we can then we sure. can do that. But if you do have to go, please let me know. Um, the next question is how. Keep going. Sorry, go ahead. No, no next, go ahead. Ne next question is uh, how often are the clients seen in the clinic, and is there an age cap to the clinic? Um, at this point, because we are, this year we're looking at those children turning 18 in this calendar year, at this point we've scheduled one visit with the knowledge that we may have to have some follow-up teleconferences to ensure that all the paperwork is complete. I think going forward, especially sort of once we hit 2015 when we're looking at expanding it to 14, it's really as much or as little as a family needs to help them get to that point where they're ready to transition. Our goal at this point is to follow till about six months after they turn 18, at which point we would meet one last time, evaluate how things are gone, have gone, and then change anything that needs changed at that point, uh, and then they can go forward. All right. And uh, here's a good question. Uh, well, not that they're all, they're all good questions, but uh, this one is particularly interesting, I thought. Uh, if, the, if the adult system was to... Uh, create a transition in model, if they took it upon themselves to do this, what do you feel would be the key components for success? I think they need a, nav a navigator on the adult side to start. And I think and the in, care plan. And the care plan um, ideally, we'd love to see a complex care adult program in which these young adults can transition to once they transition out of our complex pediatric program. Uh, the next question is, are you partnering uh, with community care access centers in your Lynn regarding the system navigation piece? We absolutely are. And actually, in, um, in the process of developing the clinic, we met with um, various leads within um, our LIN um, to talk about um, current system navigation so we had a better understanding of what that currently looked like for those that uh, were in the adult world. And then also talked about how we might be able to partner as we help families transition to the adult world. So we, uh, they sit up uh, on part of our transitional care council but we've met with several people individually from CCAC within our LIN to also further talk about um, future partnerships around assisting families with transition to adult care. All right, and for There's those also, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, for those of you not from Ontario, uh, and I, I often forget, not that you're not from Ontario, but that not everyone knows what a LIN is, which is a local health integration network, which is sort of Ontario's answer to uh, regionalization, I guess you could call it, across the province. So just in case people are wondering about that term. 
the next question, and this is the last question that we have on the slate. Uh, do the families uh, do, do, do the families have to attend in person? Would you consider video conferencing or maybe even telehealth with fam families? Or would you, uh, is this something that you have, have or would consider? Uh, this person goes on to say, I have, families, I have families that are closely linked with the community services, local pediatrician, nutritionist, etc. And at times we have found it beneficial for the family to remain in the community due to travel distance, weather, other commitments, uh, loss of uh, employment for travel, etc. So the use of telehealth or video conferencing uh, to facilitate this. Absolutely, we will. Yeah. And that, that's not part of the program now, but it is something you, you're in for consideration? Or? It, 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 is. It, it is something that's currently available to us. And I must, uh, I must say that uh, we, the families that we've seen in the transitional care clinic have actually been from the re region and, haven't nest and have not been from our, our London community. And, and their preference has actually been to come and have that face-to-face -face conversation versus um, doing it through telehealth. But it is an option for families. Um, again, uh, uh, my experience is that families really like the, um, the, the contact of coming into clinic and sitting down. Um, but it is an option. And we've had both some families choose not to bring their complex child to clinic with them, and it's just to sit down with the parents. And in other cases, they're bringing their complex kids with them. So it's really um, variable as to sort of what kind of a clinic visit they want to have. All right. Well, that is the last question that we have. And I think just with the, looking at the time, we should probably close this off now. I'm sure people have uh, other places to go. Is, are there any final closing comments from, from any of our panel members? can't think of anything at this point, but we are definitely willing to share and we'd love to see what other people are doing uh, from, from those 40% that uh, have clinics up and running. Um, we're very open to uh, any advice that uh, we can get at this stage. All right. All right, well, and with the, uh, with the number of people... This is Lisa. Sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, I just wanted to say this was a fabulous presentation. Um, I'm Lisa Stromquist, and I'm the coordinator for Quality and Patient Safety at CAFC. And I just wanted to uh, um, remind people, let people know, especially our, our colleagues here at London, that we do have a community of practice for uh, transitioning uh, uh, pediatrics into the adult uh, healthcare um, world and uh, we would welcome everybody to join us uh, on these calls and if you want more information you could just uh, contact uh, contact me you know, through Doug or through myself uh, that would be great just contact us here at CAFC for more information. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I was, uh, I was, uh, thanks Lisa for jumping in with that. I did actually have it ready to go uh, uh, to show people the Pediatric Practice oh, Guidelines you? Collaborative. <laughs> Uh, and I was going to mention that we do have one of the, the four uh, collaboratives that we have is, as Lisa mentioned, on, on this issue of transition. So with all of the interest and the number of questions and the ongoing discussion, the number of people that were able to hang in uh, despite our very small technical difficulties that we were able to overcome at the beginning, and for the number that are still online, we can, it's obvious the, the interest in this topic. So, so if, as Lisa said, either contact me or Lisa at lisa's at lstromquist at cafc.org. Uh, and uh, you know we'd be more than happy to engage all of you in our work in this area because I think it's uh, we certainly benefit from having this national and even this international perspective. So, so with that, I think we'll close off this, this webinar. And uh, you know, again, I'd like to thank uh, Danielle, uh, Jill, and uh, and Val for uh, for their presentation, and in particular Brenda for bringing such a great uh, component to the story. It's always great to be, to have this information grounded in the experiences of her of our, our patients and families. So, so thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, as I, also, as I mentioned, uh, this session was recorded, so please feel free to share this with uh, your colleagues and invite them to uh, you know, uh, uh, view it on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Leave your comments there if you have other comments and questions, and we'll you know, try to continue the discussion electronically offline. And uh, with that, we'll uh, close it off. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on our next webinar. Bye.